Good morning. Good to see you guys. Oh, there you go. Now I can hear you. Now you can hear me. It's good to have you here this morning. Again, this is your first time here. Really hope that I can connect with you back at the uh, back of the auditorium before you leave. And now, if it is your first time here, you are coming to the final episode of the series that has lasted forever. Because we do a message series here where we take, you know, kind of a thought, an idea, and we just drill down on it. And we have been drilling on this thing since the beginning of the year. So I thought it was going to be, you know, like a six or seven week. Uh, number 11, they're telling me. This is number 11. I have never done anything that long other than when we did the Ten Commandments, and I have exceeded that. So, uh, or maybe it's 12. I don't even know. But it's called Practicing the Way, and it's talking, uh, we've been talking about how Jesus, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's actually presenting a whole new way of us being human. Now, that's a weird phrase. I get that. But how many of you have ever said, hey, you know, excuse me, I'm only human, right? And, and there's a lot of people who may either think that or some have some version of that. You know, that was big when I was growing up. Man, excuse me, I'm only human. What he's saying is, hey, I'm going to show you a new way to be human. I mean, that may, that may be your excuse. They may be your explanation. <laughs> but there's a whole other way of being human. So when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's not saying I'm just the way to God, which he is the way to God. He's not saying, I'm the way that you inherit eternal life and, you know, spend eternity in heaven, which he is that. He's saying it's bigger than all of that. I am the way to live life the way that God designed life. I am the way for you to fulfill your purpose. I am the way for you to reflect the image of God in which you were created. Which means, if you follow Jesus, you end up doing things his way and not so much the way the world does it. And it's very, very different. So we've been hammering on that and talking about a lot of different things about Jesus and his way. So today I want to talk about you know, or, or bring our attention to the last lesson, you know, a really big lesson that Jesus taught his followers before he faced the cross, before he was crucified and then resurrected and, and all that. So this is his, his last big lesson. Um, it's huge. Now, here's the thing. Because it was his last lesson, it didn't mean that, you know, hey, there's one more thing, kind of like an add-on. He had been teaching them this and modeling this from the very beginning. But, you know, the disciples, his followers were a lot like us. They just didn't connect the dots. Right? In fact, his very first miracle that's recorded, you know, um, some of you may know this, his very first miracle was done at a wedding where the wedding party or the, the host and all had run out of wine, and so he turns water into wine and saves the party, right? That's the kind of person you want to party with if you're a wine bibber, right? So, but anyway, so here he is at the party, and, and you would say, okay, what was the, the redemptive gospel, you know, Jesus saves the world, what was the value of that? And it's really hard to connect the dots because there, there may not be a redemptive value of that other than demonstrating he has the power to do it. But I would say that the reason he did it was because of something that was just part of his nature, part of who he is, which is so different than ours, but it's part of the way. And he wants us to have that in him. So from the beginning, he was modeling this. The disciples never saw it. And, let's, and come on, let's cut them some slack because how many of you have, have seen someone that you're inspired by but you would just kind of, you know, categorize their behavior as being them. Like, oh man, they, they're, just, they're just so encouraging and so positive and always say such nice thing. That's just them, meaning you're excused. You don't have to do that, right? So there's a lot of things that Jesus was doing that they were saying, well, that's just him. But we're excused. That doesn't mean we have to do it that way, right? And so Jesus, at the end of his life here, his, his earthly life, um, or just before the cross, he helps them connect the dots by surfacing this hugely important message that I think we all need to hear, or maybe hear again with some fresh ears. Now, I'll give you a little background. We're going to read from the Gospel of Mark. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, the biographies of Jesus. And we're going to um, read from Mark. It's chapter 10. Uh, to, to set you up, though, this is like two weeks, maybe a week and a half or so, or two weeks before Jesus faces the cross. So we're at the, the final part of the earthly ministry, so to speak, and when this whole thing kind of comes to the surface. So the story starts, Mark, on Mark chapter 10, it says, they, meaning Jesus and his followers, were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Now, when you read that second little part, okay, they're on their way to a city. Jesus is out in front leading the way, right? We expect him to do that. 
And the disciples are astonished that he's out in front leading the way. And people are afraid that Jesus is, or, or they're astonished they're going to Jerusalem. They're afraid they're going, I mean, Jerusalem is the epicenter of all the spiritual activity for the Jewish people. It's the, kind of the epicenter of what they think is God's activity in the world, right? It's where all the religious leaders and all the government leaders and everything else is kind of their Washington, D.C., right? And so why are they astonished and why are they afraid? And if you go back and like read the buildup to this, you would think that I missed something here. But, but here's the reason that they're astonished. The disciples are just, they're astonished at how Jesus is entering into this moment. They're astonished that he is going into a place where his enemies who sit in the seats of power are waiting. And now at this point, they're rock stars, right? I mean, they've done so many miracles. Even Jesus' followers and disciples have done some miracles, right? And they have healed people, and they have, you know, cast out demons, and they have multiplied food, and they have even seen Jesus raise the dead. So they're pretty much rock stars, and they've got a following. And here are the followers, you know, the crowd is picking up as they're getting to Jerusalem. More and more people are joining the entourage, and they're afraid, Because he's heading to Jerusalem. And you say, why? Are they astonished at how he is doing this or where they're... It's it's weird, but but John goes on to tell us. He says, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem. Up does not mean north. Up means uphill because Jerusalem's on a hill. So I don't care where you're going, north, south, east, or west. It's always up, right? We're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed, meaning it's an insider. Somebody who knows me, someone who's a friend, someone who's in the group, is going to betray me to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They, those chief priests and teachers of the law, will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, which is a huge insult to Jewish people. I mean, it's like, think of this, you know, Americans. It's like taking an American citizen and handing them over to an enemy nation, right? Right? Even, even if you disagreed with this American and what they've done, even if they were guilty of something, you're not going to hand them over to an enemy. They're Americans. And so he's saying, look, they're going to condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, which does not mean just whip with a stick. It means to use a device that will literally pull the flesh from the muscle and from the bone and kill him. And three days he will rise again. Which again, we know the story, right? Many of us, we all know the story that he, he's going to be you know, crucified and then laid in the tomb and then ta-da, he rises from the dead. So we just sit there and go, no big deal, right? I mean, that's horrible, that's bad, nobody wants to go through that. But he's going to rise from again, so we're good, it's all good, right? Let me just ask, have any of you or any of your loved ones ever faced a life-threatening or life-saving surgery? And they talk about all the risks and all that's going to be involved. And then they say, but after the surgery they can expect or you can expect 100% recovery. Do you go, oh, no problem then. Let's get this thing done. (laughs) No, right? Knowing that you'll have 100% recovery does not relieve anxiety, the suffering, and the pain, and all of the emotions that are going into the actual surgery. So first of all, let's just not skip past what he is saying. This is going to be horrific. You are going to see your best friend, your mentor, the one you have lived 24-7 with for about, you know, mostly for the last three years. Everything in your life is invested in this relationship, his claims, who he is, where he's going, what he's going to do. And you're going to see him physically ripped apart. You're going to see him rejected. You're going to see him falsely accused. You're going to see him handed over to, you know, unclean, those lawless, those immoral people who are then going to shred him and then kill him. And so you don't just skip past that to say, and then he's going to rise again. Oh, and by the way, when we think that the disciples are just kind of clueless, like he keeps saying he's going to rise again. Why don't they put this together? Because they don't. When Jesus... When he's executed and he's put in that tomb, and all of a sudden they show up the next day because they want to finish preparing the body and spend a little more time because they ran out of time. And so they want to go back and do it right. When they see the stones rolled away and the place is empty, they don't think, he rose again. They think someone stole the body. No one was expecting rise again. Even though he says it, three days he'll rise. And we're thinking, gosh, how stupid can they be? He said it over and over. But here's the thing that we don't understand. See, the Jewish tradition or the Jewish belief is that the soul, a person's soul will hover around their body for three days before it returns to God the Father, our creator. So when he says, 
all this terrible stuff's going to happen, and then I'm going to die, and then three days I'm going to rise again. Here's how they're reading it. Yeah, all this bad stuff's going to happen, and then three days later your soul will go to be back with God the Father. They're not thinking physical. They're not thinking the body's going to come up and we're going to be eating breakfast with him by that you know, third day afternoon or something, or, or that night he's going to show up, right? And we're going to be spending a few days with him later. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking just like all the other Jews. Yeah, your, your, your soul's going to hover around like it does. And, and by the way, if you've ever seen some of the, the ancient tombs that they have over there and some of the ones that are carved into little caves, they have these little windows at the top. And they're, they're small windows, not big enough for a body or like somebody to crawl through so they can't steal stuff. It's just enough for the soul to escape three days later. So they're thinking, yeah, three days, you're going to rise like everybody else does. Your soul's going to go back to the Father. Now think about it. Your best friend, your mentor, the one you have invested your life in for three days has talked about how he is going to be brutally treat treated. His body is going to be shredded. He is going to be humiliated, executed, and crucified. And there's this moment, this lingering moment where it's like, okay, so guys, let's get going. Let's get back on the road. Now you know why they're astonished. Now you know why they're afraid. And then a couple of his disciples say, hey, it's now or never. Got a question. So then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him and says, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. We know it's now or never. And this, this, is, this is getting to be the climactic moment. So the question, what do you want me to do? Let one of us sit on your right and one on your left in your glory. I mean, it, can anybody just speak up and say, hey, dude, bad timing, bad timing, <laughs> right? I mean, we're standing here making the funeral arrangements, you know, the pre-arrangement thing that you go to the funeral home and make the pre-arrangement. You're sitting at the table at the funeral home. I don't know if you've ever done this. As a pastor, I've done it a few times. And you're pre-arranging because somebody knows they've got the death sentence and they know it's coming and all that. And it's like me looking around and going, hey, um, now or never. Um, when you're gone, can I get your stuff? Right? I mean, so, so, listen, legitimate question. Because when you're gone, somebody's got to step up to the plate, right? And you know how this is. With the president, you see this. When the president does a presidential address, right, in State of the Union and all that, there you have in the shot number one, number two, number three. Number one, number two, number three. Right? And so this is what he's saying. Okay, Jesus, you're, you're number one. But can one of us be number two and somebody else be number three? In the order of succession, because right? we got to keep this thing going. you got something good going. And, and so one of us could, and, and it's a legitimate question. Don't, don't, don't slam these guys. Maybe bad timing, legitimate question. Who's going to be in charge of the movement, right? Who's going to be tapped to take the title and to move on? Who's, who's going to do that? So can it be one of us on the right and the left? And you would go, okay, How, what audacity. Why do they think they have the right? Well, let's just pause for a moment. James and John were two of the first four disciples that were chosen. You had Peter, Andrew, James, and John, probably all selected on the same day when Jesus said, come follow me, because they're all fishermen, all fish in the same lake, probably fishing from the same boat. In fact, some would say that they were cousins, right? So you got these brothers and those brothers, they're cousins. So you've got the four of them. So here's the thing. We were two of the originals. We were here from day one. We've heard all the lessons, all the sermons, all the stories, so all the miracles. We, we were part of the initial group, right? Not only that, James is the oldest of all the disciples. And so you know how this works, right, with the family. We're the oldest brothers in charge. So James, I mean, he's the oldest, obviously. And then John, when John writes his gospel account, he doesn't refer to himself as John. He refers to himself as the one Jesus loves. So he thinks he's pretty special, right? I mean, he's, he's a favorite, right? Maybe the baby in the family. So he's like, hey, we got the oldest one. We got the youngest one, the most loved one, right? We got the earliest ones. And here's the other thing. We were part of the inner circle. It, you know, it was Pete, James, and John, right? And so they were the ones that got snuck off. When Jesus, the first time Jesus, it was the synagogue leader, his daughter, who died. And so everybody was mourning and grieving and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus sent everybody out of the room except for the girl's parents and Pete, James, John. Y'all come in. Y'all need to see this because you need to have witnesses. And, and by the way, for there to be witnesses, you have to have at least two or three people who agree to the same thing. That's how it worked in the Jewish court. So here, three of y'all, come on, you're going to be the witnesses. So they got to see him raise the dead for the first time. Whenever he goes up on a mountain, he sends all the other disciples kind of away. And he says, hey, Pete, James, John, come on with me. And they got to see him transfigured. Like he went from the, the human flesh Jesus to like son of God, whatever that looked like. And then 
He's talking to Elijah, an Old Testament prophet, and Moses. And they've been gone for thousands of years. And here they are talking about God's redemptive plan. And they're witnessing it. And they saw it. They were involved in the miracles. They were the ones who got to go into the different cities and the different places to share the gospel and to preach the gospel. They, they were the insiders. They were entrusted with the gospel. They were entrusted to do miracles. They were entrusted with insider information, right? And he says, I want to sit on your right and I want to sit on your left. And here's why. Because they're entitled. That is. Can you find that? Thank you. Because I'm going to start preaching in a rhythm here in a minute. Okay? I'm supposed to wrap the rest of this or something. Okay? If I could. So here's the thing. It's entitlement. They're entitled. And before we slam, guys, we all have a sense of that. Come on, let's not, let's not just push. I mean, we, we're in an entitled generation, right? Everybody feels entitled, 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 entitled. That's the problem. We're all entitled. And before you say they're entitled, I'm not entitled. Oh, we all feel entitled. Bless God, we're Americans. It's part of the American nature to feel entitled. You know, I guarantee you, you travel anywhere else in the world and it's like, by God, I'm an American. I'm entitled to something, right? And we all demand our rights. You want to know, here's what entitled looks like. It's getting ready to happen. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. Okay? And you have this Easter egg hunt, which is why we have to you know, kind of separate kids. Because here's what happens at Easter. You've got the kids who are out there in front. And you know when you get out there, I don't care if there's 30 eggs or 3,000. Which, by the way, we have to stuff 3,000 eggs this Wednesday. Please come help us. Please <laughs> come help us. Okay? It's Wednesday night. So, okay. Here's what happens. Those kids will get out there. The oldest, the biggest, the fastest, and the ones who show up first get all the eggs. Right? And they would say, well, of course we did. We're entitled. We're bigger, we're faster, we showed up first, right? That's why we got all the eggs. But then you have the parents who are walking out with infants who cannot even eat what's in the egg, <laughs> saying, my child deserves some eggs. Look how cute they are. They're entitled because they're cute, <laughs> right? And then you've got the slow kids in between, right? <laughs> and the small kids in between, and you're like, well, they're entitled because I helped donate some of the candy to send those eggs. And, and we can all make a case for why we are all entitled to something, right? And if you hear it and, and we'd all listen to each other, we'd sit there and go, well, you know, they got a point. They're right. And so James and John are asking this question, maybe bad timing, but they're losing the window of opportunity and somebody's got to do it. So let's just step up and, hey, we're the early ones in. Well, what about Peter? Well, it wasn't Peter and Andrew. It was just Peter. And there's only two positions right and left. So the brothers got it. Sorry, Peter. Love you. Okay. So here's the thing. Now, it may not be Easter eggs. Let's just go back to a little point in history here where we can all relate. I don't care what side of the issue you were on during COVID. I don't care if you were pro-mask, anti-mask. I don't care if you were pro-assembly, stop assembly. I don't care what side you were on. Pick a side, I'll pick the other, and we can beat each other up, okay? But here's what I will tell you. It all came down to entitled. I'm entitled to meet when I meet with who I want to meet with. Other people, I'm entitled to live in a community where I feel safe and I don't have to fear getting catching something. I'm entitled to, to not wear a mask. I'm entitled to be able to walk around in public and not be afraid of somebody sneezing on me. I, we're all entitled. And we thought about it and it was all about rights and rights and rights and rights and rights. Everybody's talking about their rights. That's what it looks like when you're entitled. And Jesus goes on to say, James and John, you have no idea what you're asking. You do not know what this requires to have that kind of positional authority or power. And they say, sure we do. And he says, can you drink the cup of suffering or the cup that I'm about to drink? They said, sure. And he's like, you have no idea. I just told you what I was going to go through and you can't even get a picture of how bad it's going to be. And he goes on, he says, but one day you will drink from that cup. And when you do, you will not feel entitled, I promise you. You'll drink from that cup one day. But these positions are not mine to give. They are for whoever they are for. So I'm not here to just hand them out because that's not what I'm about. Now, when they asked this question, it started an argument. 
Mark goes on and says, when the other 10 heard this, they became indignant with James and John. It's like, how dare, dude, timing, come on. He just talked about what's going to happen to him. Do you think this is the best time? And it's like, we're on the way to Jerusalem. If that really happens, this is the window. This is it. When are we going to talk about it? Now, come on, man. And by the way, why do you think you guys deserve that? Why is it you? Why isn't it Peter? Right? Peter's the one who identified him as the Messiah first. Peter is the one who got the keys to the kingdom, right? It was really given to everybody, but you know how we associate. Peter's the one who's kind of led us. Why not Peter? Why do you think, wait, why not, why not Matthew? Matthew had some stuff, right? Matthew's done some things. Matthew, he had some clout you know, with the Romans and different things because he worked for them for a while. Why is it that, so they all start to have the argument. And so Jesus stops the little parade again. Hey, let's pull over. Let's get over here under the shade. We need to have a conversation, boys. <laughs> right? And Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. You know that the ones who, who aren't concerned about you know, the nature of God, the will of God, the, the morality that you guys as Jewish seem to have the edge on, because you know, y'all, are, y'all are more spiritual. I know that's what you think. You know the ones who aren't so spiritual in your mind? You know how they do this? They, they take their authority and they lord it over. And, and then there's people that are over them, right? The people that they're high officials who exercise authority. Over. In, in other words, you know how they set up a pecking order, right? We have that, don't we? We have the pecking order. You got that at work. You got that at school. Maybe have it in your home. Maybe have it in your neighborhood. Gosh, we have it in the church, right? You got the pecking order. You know how that works? Right? And everybody's trying to clamor to the top. Right? And, and, and you just worry about who you're in charge of and you try to make sure that there's more people under you than above you. You know how that works, right? And then he says this, not so with you. But, but Jesus, that's just the way the world is. That's just the way leadership is done. And he said, I'm showing you another way to be human. Another way to do leadership. Another way to organize yourself, another way to think of power and authority and all of that. Not so with you. This is what's going to make you different, a different way. He goes on, he says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Come on, some of y'all, you've heard this. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard this. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all slave of all. He goes on, he says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. And who are the many? People who didn't deserve it. Not worthy of it. People who didn't ask, who probably won't say thank you and may not even change. The son of man. Come on, guys. This is huge. This is huge. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life in exchange for many. Now, here's the thing. Jesus did not object to their desire to want to lead. He didn't say your desire to want to be in charge and to lead and to have positions and all that. That's not what was offensive. That's not what he objected to, right? It's good to want to do that. If you say, man, I wish I was the boss of this company, because if so, what? How would you do it better? How would you do it differently? So he's like, it's okay to want to be in charge. He's just saying, when you're in charge, I want you to do it differently. He introduces a whole new way that confronts entitlement. In fact, it slaps entitlement in the face. It's called servant leadership. Servant leadership. Now, that's just now starting to really catch on in the corporate world. Because the corporate world, with all the scandals and everything else that's gone on, even in government and in politics, we talk about civil servants. But come on. You know, servant leadership is just now catching on. But Jesus is the one who introduced this. Now, think of this. The Son of Man. When God, the creator of everything with all power, chooses to step into his own creation, he does not come here to whip everybody in the shape so that we will serve him. He steps into his own creation to serve his creation. Did you catch that? That he 
He takes on the form of a slave to everyone, making himself accessible to everyone else to lift us up, to help us out. Listen, it's not, I'm going to whip you into shape so that you'll fulfill my purpose. It's the, no, 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 you were created for a purpose you're not fulfilling. I'm here to help you fulfill your purpose. That's huge. I mean, when, you, when you talk to somebody of power, of stature doing that, but when you say God became flesh to serve, the only response is, wow. <laughs> Wow. Wow. And, and here's the thing. We only serve, I mean, we get this. We understand servant leadership. We like to focus on the leadership part, not so much the servant part. So when we get to the servant part, is only the means to get to the leadership part. So we're going to serve so that we can lead. Now, there's a guy who comes around in 1970. His name um, uh, Rudolph Greenleaf, he's the one who coined the phrase servant leadership, wrote a book on that. He became the father of servant leadership. But I want to tell you something. Jesus modeled this, and he is the first notable person in all of history to introduce this concept of servant leadership and have modeled it in such a way. So, listen, Greenleaf, he may have got the credit for the term, but Jesus was calling for this long before this guy. And, and listen, even Greenleaf, when you read this and go through this, it's like, hey, I'm the leader because I serve, and I serve because I'm the leader. So serving somebody is the means to getting in charge. And that completely misses the point of what Jesus is trying to say. You're just using it as a means to an end, not realizing the people you serve are the end. You don't serve in order to be over them. You serve because you value them. It's not just the means to an end. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talked about this debate. Matthew, he, re, he retells the story a little differently. He said, you know, when I remember that conversation, I don't, I don't remember it was James and John asking the question. I remember it was their mama asking the question. I mean, I think they put her up to it because, you know, go send your mama, right? Or maybe she was just, you know, the mama bear who was looking out for her kids and was like, hey, running out of time, running out. So I, I remember Salome, the, their mother coming up and saying, hey, Jesus, do me a favor. Would you let one of my sons sit on the right and the left? And so Matthew records it in the same scenario, same, Jesus has the same response. Luke, he, when he's doing his investigation and doing the you know, research about that, and aware of the story, he said, well, I remember sometime they were talking about like who's going to be first and who's going to be second, who's going to be greatest. And somebody informed him, oh, yeah, that was at the Last Supper. I remember at the Last Supper, they had this debate that broke out about who was going to be the greatest. And you know why it happened at the Last Supper? Well, who's going to sit where at the table? Jesus is the host. He's going to be in the middle. Who's going to be on the right and who's going to be on the left? Because they got roles to play in the, the Passover meal, right? And so they're probably clamoring to get to the table. And so they started this debate of who's going to be greatest and who's going to be first. And so the conversation took place there maybe around the Last Supper. But John, when he goes to talk about this and how Jesus surfaced this, he doesn't talk about the conversation. Instead, he, he records a demonstration. He records what Jesus did to show them. In John chapter 13, it says, it was just before the Passover feast. So here we are, the night he's going to be arrested. Jesus knew, he knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to his father. So he knew the time was short. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the reason I highlighted that is because here's the thing, he knew. He knew that Judas had already gone out and betrayed him. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. He knew that all the others were going to run and hide for self-preservation, self-protection. He knew what was going to happen. And yet all of those who would betray him, deny him, and abandon him, he's going to love them to the end. It says the evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, and Jesus knew it, to betray Jesus. His betrayers there in the room. Jesus, it says, he knew, goes on, he knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He, he can control the weather and the storm and the waves, that, that he could multiply, you know, these, these inanimate objects. He could make things material. That's like a creative miracle of calling things into existence that were not there. He could heal the sick, cast out demons. He could mend broken relationships, mend broken hearts, set people free. He could raise the dead. He knew he had all power. And he also knew that he had come from God and he was returning from God. He knew exactly who he was, where he was from, where he was going. 
In other words, if there was anything in his humanity that had to be discovered about his identity, at this point he knows it all. Now, what do you do when you know what you know and you have all that power? When you know your betrayer's in the room and what he's done, when you know the other ones are going to abandon you, when you know the one's going to deny you, what do you do when you have all of that knowledge, know who you are, know where you stand with God, where you're coming, where you're going, and you have all of that power? So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel, or the word there, apron, a work apron, a wrap around his waist. He said, took off his outer garment. Here's the thing. Rabbis wore certain clothing. It's why when Jesus would walk up to strangers, they would all say, hey, rabbi. The way I describe it is, you know, if you've been to colleges and universities, you've seen the graduation and the professors all come out, you know, on the, on the stage and they got their robes and they got the three stripe things and the little whatevers. And, and you know, which one's the master's degree, which one's doctoral degree, you even know what school or department or science that they're from. And so you know to call them doctor or professor or whatever. Or when you see a military person, you know, you know whether they got the bars or whether they got the birds or whether they got the clovers or whether they got the, the stars. You know to call them general, right? The outfit gives them away. I love it. Jesus takes off the outer garment. He takes off the symbol of his entitlement. The symbol. The, the thing that told everybody the level of respect you're supposed to give him. He takes it off. And he puts on an apron. He puts on the outfit of someone who's about to serve. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel of the apron that was wrapped around him. Now, the story goes on. Peter objects, says, Lord, you're not going to do that. I love it. He says, Lord, sir, master, my teacher, the one who is over me, you're not going to do this to me. And, of course, Jesus insisted and said, look, if I don't do this, you're not going to have any part with me. And Peter's like, I don't like the all or nothing here. <laughs> and he says, okay, so fine. If, if you've got to wash my feet and it's all or nothing, then let's just do all of it, right? Wash my hand, my head. Let's just, let's just give me a bath. Go for it. Let's just sit right here and do this. And Jesus says, no, a person that's had a bath really only needs to have his feet cleaned. Right? In other words, <clears throat> Peter, most of you's fine. There's just a part of you that needs attention. And he washes his feet and he said, now you're clean. He said, but not all of you because he knew of Judas. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And he said, so here's the thing. I'm just washing the dirty parts, but there's a part of Judas that he's not giving me access to. That goes back to a message we just talked about, isn't it? You see, we want to offer God our best, but the creator of the universe stepped into our world to take our worst. He wants access to the worst of us, the embarrassing part, the, the part. Now, here's the custom. You know, they come into a place like this, and they would have to wash their feet. And the reason being, they have open-toed shoes or sandals or whatever. And so when they get down at a table, they don't put their feet under a table and sit at a chair. They actually have low tables, and they lay on the ground, and they're all kind of huddled up around this table. So if you're laying on a table, leaning to one side and all that, and eating your meal, realize somebody's feet are probably right behind your head. It'd be nice to have clean toes there. Right? So you got feet and face and all that kind of stuff that's going on. Now, here's the thing. Now, now you see, you've, you've heard this. Some of y'all have heard this, right? They always have a servant wash the feet. It was the, the, the lowest servant would wash the feet. But not every household could afford to have servants to wash the feet. So it's kind of like the beach house. Y'all been, you know, done this maybe. You go to the beach house. And I remember when I was a kid growing up, play out in the sand. You get ready to come into the house, right? You take your flip-flops off, kick them there, and there's the bucket of water. You got to step in, rinse the sand off, and walk in, right? Don't track the dirt in the house. You've done that. So the average home would have had a basin sitting there and maybe some water sitting to the side, and you could wash your own feet. You could just go in there, and you could just step in the basin, take the little thing, wash your own feet, dry them off on the towel, and move on, even if there wasn't a servant. Now, if it's a nice little, you know, kind of the you know, Ritz Carlton, then, hey, somebody's there to wash your feet. That's great. That's awesome. But they could do it themselves. Why is it that Jesus is having to wash their feet? And here's why. Because I think they were all rushing to the table. Because they were all entitled to the first seat and the second seat. That's why the argument broke out. Let me just bypass. Why. While they're washing their feet, I'll go get the prime spot. Right? Let me just get past the custom. We don't care. We all live together. We're fine. They know me. I know them. Feet, feet, whatever. I've seen worse in the last three years hanging with these guys. So here we go. Let's just, while they wash feet, I'll go do this. So everybody's skipping washing their own feet. They're definitely not washing one another's feet. And when it gets to the point in the meal. Jesus gets up, takes off his entitlement, puts on the servant, and goes and washes their feet. 
It says, when he finished washing their feet, he put back on his clothes. He put back on the robe that would have come with that title, that recognition, everything else. And then he returned to his place in the middle of the table, the host, the one who is going to lead the Passover meal and says, do you understand what I've done for you? To which no one answers because they know when he's asking a question, there's probably a catch. I I know what I saw you do. I don't know why you did it. I know what I saw you do. Feet's really not important right now, Jesus. But he goes on, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, that's who I am. I am entitled to those titles. And I'm entitled to the respect that comes with those titles. And I'm entitled to all of the perks that come with those titles. That's who I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, the entitled one, took that entitlement off and washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I set for you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Because I tell you the truth, No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And there are so many things as followers of Jesus. Let me just talk to the insiders for a moment. As followers of Jesus, there's just so many things that says, well, yeah, but he's Jesus. I'm just not doing that. Are you greater? Are you somehow exempt? Because if he, your Lord and Savior, can put aside his entitlements as the son of God, the creator of the universe. If he can set those entitlements aside and come and serve you, then how dare you say you're entitled to something that would keep you from serving someone else. Now, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them, not if you read them, talk about them in your small group, memorize the passages, preach it, point it out to others. You're going to be blessed if you do it. And again, he says, because if you don't do it, you're like the guy who builds his house on the sand. There's nothing that there is, there's regret when you make some mistakes in life and you didn't know better. And you're like, gosh, I just, I wish somebody had told me. I wish I knew. I just didn't know. And oh my gosh, this is terrible. But then there's the regret of, I knew better. I was told and I knew, and I ignored, and now I'm suffering. Boy, that's a whole different level of regret, right? That's a whole different level of regret. And he said, you will be blessed, and you'll be a blessing when you set aside what you deserve, think you deserve, feel you deserve, actually deserve, (laughs) for those who are less deserving, or maybe those who don't deserve it at all. That's when you'll be blessed, and that's when you'll be a blessing. Can you imagine what the world would look like if just the followers of Jesus would do that? If when something like COVID or something else hit, that we're not so loud and quick to scream about our rights, but we were the first ones to step up and start taking responsibility for people. Wow. Wow. I know some of you are going to hear that, and you're going to hear nothing but politics behind that statement, and you missed the entire point. It has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with character and testimony and reflecting Jesus. It has nothing to do with politics. So here's the question. What do you do with what you're entitled to? What do you do with what you're entitled to? Now, let me just throw a list up here really quick, because we're all entitled, and you say, I don't think I'm entitled to anything. Yes, you are. We all feel it. Every, I feel it, right? Here's some things you're entitled to. Opinions, right? You've heard that. Well, I'm entitled to have my opinion. Yes, you are. You're entitled to your opinion. Time, money, and possessions, and influence, right? We, I'm entitled to my opinion. You're right. And this is what's funny. You're, you're entitled. We're all entitled to our opinions, even when our opinions conflict with Jesus, and even when our opinions conflict with reality. I mean, you can have all the facts, and they can tell you exactly, these are the facts, and it can be proven scientifically. Well, I just have my opinion. Well, you can have your opinion, even if it denies reality. But now let's get to the spiritual side. Well, I know what Jesus said, but I just have a different opinion. Well, you're entitled to it. Except, I love what Jesus says, you call me Lord and teacher, and rightly so. Because that's what I am. And here's the thing. You can have your opinion until the teacher says, but your opinion doesn't matter. Mine does. 
And you can say, well, I have my right to my opinion until your Lord and master says, but my opinion is the one that matters. How is it that you can call me Lord and teacher and not do what I say? Well, because I have an opinion, right? And so I'm entitled to my opinion. But here's the thing we do. We set aside our entitlements to our opinions and we just say, you know what? This is my opinion, but I could push that aside because this is his command. This is what he wants. This is his desire. Uh, my time. It's my time. I, I have worked my tail to the bone. I have not had a day off. I am finally getting a day off. I finally get a night off. I finally get the weekend to myself. I finally get whatever. It is my time. And the reason you feel that it's your time and you're entitled to it is because you've worked so hard for it. Which goes to another message we talked in the series about working for rest or working from it. And if we start by working from rest, meaning I'm not having to earn everything that my heavenly father provides for me. And he wants me to start with the realization that I can rest up before I go and work up. But we don't do that. We just launch out working hard and then we get to a day off and we collapse and it's my time. But hey, we're entitled to it. But if we would surrender the entitlement to our time, our schedule, our day, and we would actually embrace his and take his, we would be working from rest and realize he's given us margins to do some things for him. And it's my money, my possession. Come on, I worked for it. I saved for it. I borrowed it, <laughs> borrowed to, to buy it. And you think, yeah, what comes to me is for me. Everything that comes to me is for me, so I'm entitled to it. Until you start to realize, wait, my heavenly Father provides everything that I have, and he has blessed me, and he has given me, and so therefore, am I entitled to it, or am I just entrusted with it? Well, then there comes your influence, you know, your power, your position, you know, your reputation, your network, and it's like, well, I'm, enti I'm entitled to at least guard my reputation. I'm entitled, you know, to my own achievements. I'm, I'm at least in entitled to the position and the power that I've worked my way up to. Yeah, yeah, probably. But we just use it all for self-promotion. Isn't that the way the world does that? You know, I, I go to the gym and work out, and there's guys there, and, you know, some of them are pretty buff and all that. And, you, and you've seen and sometimes I'll follow, you know, on the Internet and look at some different exercise routines and different things and all that. And it's... But you see these guys that have these massive muscles. I mean, the bodybuilders. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're bold. they got muscles where I don't even know muscles exist. I don't, they just get new ones, right? New places. You know what I'm talking about? They're huge, right? I mean, they're massive, and they got veins. It looks like a road map on their, it's awesome, okay? It's woo. And you look at all those muscles and everything. Now, it's one thing if you're like a football player or like a superhero, okay? But for the rest of these guys, I just want to ask, what do you do with all them muscles? And you know what they do with those muscles, right? They flex. That's what they do. I mean, I've seen some of them in the gym, in the mirror. I mean, this, that's, here's what they do with the muscle. Okay? That, that, that's what they do with it. Like, dude, you got some awesome arms. What do you do with them? It's like, wow. What else you got? Okay? And it's like, now, that's cool. It's like, hey, dude, you got some awesome muscles. I got a senior adult lady who's moving this week. Can you help? Oh, dude, nice. I ain't got no time for that. Well, what are you doing to muscles? <laughs> Guys, can I tell you? I think there's a lot of us who treat our lives and all the stuff that we have like a bodybuilder. And we've got our influence and our opinions and we've got our time and we've got our money and all we do is flex it. And we're just so proud that we got it. But what you going to do with all the muscles? Yeah, we got an opportunity that's coming up. I, I just, I, I, again, if we can find a way to do this in the world, let me tell you how we can do this collectively as a church. We've got an opportunity that has landed itself. Now, we've talked for years about possibly planting a church or planting a location or planting a satellite. And can I tell you, in the last month and a half, in fact, it's been longer than that. I mean, we've gone back, and I keep telling our staff and our elders, guys, I can't believe what God is doing. Now, you may not see it all. You don't, you don't see the numbers, the data. You don't hear the life change stories. You don't see the new people. But for those of us who are on the inside, and get to see this, it is like, what is God doing? I've been saying it over and over. Y'all, God's preparing us for something. God's preparing us for something. God's preparing us for something. He is, he's sending the people and, and not just general people, but people like people with some gifts and talents and certain things and experiences. And, and then he's resources and, and it, God's doing something. And then in the last four or five weeks, we've had opportunities that just landed upon us to plant a location in Dahlonega. 
And then on the heels of that, we've talked about this for a while, possibly in Clarksville. And then we've been working for a while with Hispanics and, and or wanting to have a Hispanic thing in, in White County. And it's almost like some of these things are happening and I can't force it and I don't want to force it, but I'm just like, wow, how are these conversations all happening at the same time? Not just conversations, locations, facilities, people, resource. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Now here's the thing. Can I tell you, if we're going to launch campuses somewhere, and, and by the way, all of you who got a card in the mail in White County, those from Lumpkin County got a similar card about Easter, and it says, hey, we're considering or we're exploring launching a campus here, come on Easter to find out more. So we're going to be talking about this in the next couple of weeks. We've already started receiving phone calls. I've already had a couple of phone calls, and those cards just went out. Some of them just got them last week. And it's like, wow, here's the thing. When we start talking about that, whoo, this is exciting. It's kind of like we were on our way up to Dahlonega, and, <laughs> right? And this conversation starts happening about all this kind of, and it's like, wait, okay. Here's the thing. If we're going to do that, it's going to take people, like, we, we still need resources. And, and God's already provided some, but we're going to need some heavy givers, people who are champions who will say, I will give just like we're going to build a brand new church, and I'm going to give the money that I'm entitled to for my retirement, my vacation, my boat, my second house, my whatever, I now realize I've been entrusted with and empowered with. It's going to take that kind of giving. It's going to take people who say, you know what I love about the bridge is our hospitality and the people are so welcoming who carry that to these other places. I love our children's program and the way the hall is and everything. And it's just awesome how they can connect with God. And we got to have people do that. Here's what it's going to take. There's going to be people who have opinions and say, I don't think we ought to do that because I might lose my pastor or I might lose this or we might lose that and all that. And I just like, you're entitled to your opinions. But what if God said move? It's, it, but my time, you don't understand, I've worked so hard and all that. It's going to take people having to give uh, their time, volunteering, serving with kids and, and reproducing, driving farther, doing all of that. Money and possessions. I mean, it's going to take all of this to make that happen. But yet we're entitled and we have rights and this is now going to. And Jesus says, whatever you think you're entitled to, can you take that off, set it aside, grab an apron? Because here's the thing with those disciples. Every one of them walked right past the water basin and said, Somebody needs to do it, and somebody will do it, just not me. Somebody needs to do it, and somebody will do it, just not me. Because i got to find my place. I want to get to my place, right? What if... Now, that's how we can do it as a church. What if we all did this individually with your neighbors, with your friends, the people you work with? You, you listen, these, these two statements that are about to come up on the screen, just a second. You cannot focus your life and direct your life at both of them at the same time. You can't. Right? It's one of those things like right in front of you or what's there. You can't focus at the same time. You're going to have to choose which one of these statements is going to be the focus of your life. Here it is. I have the right to or I'm responsible for Young adults, they get married and all that, and it's like, man, we've worked hard. We've made a lot of money, or we're making good money. I have the right to spend the weekend how I want to. I have the right to sleep in, maybe, if you're successful enough, if I want to. I have a right to pick my schedule, work from home, go into the office. I have a right to eat what I want to eat. I have a right to buy whatever car I want. I have a right to spend the money the way I want. I have a right to go on vacation when I want. I am entitled because I've worked hard. And then you have a baby. And suddenly you shift from all the things you have a right to, to the one you're responsible for. Isn't that true? And the ones who don't do that, you're terrible parents. You know that, right? Okay, there's a government agency. They'll remind you if you don't make the shift. Right? Because suddenly I'm responsible for. You can't focus on what you have a right to and the ones you're responsible for. You can't focus on what you have a right to and whatever it is you're responsible for. What would it look like if we all made that shift? I mean all in, not just occasionally here and there. Again, an, another way to put it, I'm entitled to or I'm empowered for. I'm entitled to or I'm empowered for. What if we all made the shift of, of stopping, to, stopping this, I'm entitled to I'm empowered. I'm entitled to all of my wealth and my possessions, or man, I have been empowered financially for something. I'm entitled. I'm entitled to the influence that I have. I'm entitled to the reputation I have, or man, I have been empowered with influence and a reputation and a network. Man, I, I'm entitled, right? 
I, I'm entitled to the time that I have on my calendar, my plate, or I've been empowered with some hours and some margin that I can do something with. You can't focus on both of those at the same time. What if we, just the followers of Jesus, listen, if, if just the followers of Jesus did this, non-Christians may still not believe what we believe, and they may still think we're crazy and somewhat of a cult for the goofy beliefs that we have, <laughs> but they'll want their kids to marry yours. <laughs> they will want you to be their neighbor. They will, hey, listen, they will want you to work for them, and they would love to work for you if you lived like this, right? So, what if we set aside rights and instead we just assumed responsibilities? Let me ask it this way. What you gonna do with all them muscles? What you gonna do with all them muscles? I hope this week you will find a way to, to be great. Here's what Jesus did. As we get ready, let's do communion. Let's do it together. The, the, the seats in front of you have these down there in front. If you're on the front row, somebody's going to get it, and they'll bring them across here to you. If you're on that front row in the second section, they're already bringing it to you. It was the, the reason I say it was the last and greatest lesson that Jesus ever taught his followers. It's because this lesson about taking off his outer garment the one that came with all the accolades, the one that came with all the recognition, the one that came with the titles, the one that came with the respect and the honor, the one that came with maybe the perks, you know, the, the golf membership, the, 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 the fancy dinners, you know, he got to eat in the homes of some pretty notable people, all because he wore this robe that called him a rabbi and their culture respected it. And, and here's the thing, he's the son of God. I mean, man, man, that got him something, right? All of those things. It wasn't because he had a conversation on the side of the road. That wasn't the last and greatest lesson. That's where he introduced it. It wasn't even because he washed their feet at the Last Supper. That's where he really demonstrated it. It's because he loved us to the end. And they stripped him naked. And they shredded his body and broke it. And he spilled his blood. And he gave his life. The creator of the universe served to the end. And he set for us an example. Not just that we remember what he does. Not that we're just inspired by what he does. But that we would pick up our cross and follow him and do what he does. This is his body that was broken for you, that he spent his entire earthly life serving us. And to the end, he did it so that he could bring out the best in us. It wasn't the means to an end. It, was, it wasn't just so that we bow our knee and worship him, which we will and we should, and he deserves it. He did it solely because you're worth it. Let's do this and remember him. When he gave his blood, he did it with no guarantee that you would ever thank him or that you would ever change. But he did it nonetheless because you were worth it. Because he would not retain his rights. Instead, he looked at you and your life and where it was headed and he took responsibility. He took responsibility. He laid aside his entitlements and he realized as God himself in flesh I've been empowered to heal them, to forgive them, to help them. Let's do this and remember him. Now, before I pray, if you're interested in what we're going to be doing in those locations, you might want to be part of a launch team. You might just want to find out more. You're not even sure. Wednesday nights after Easter, we're going to start meeting about that. But can you leave here today and find a way to help in your home neighborhood? Listen, some of you, it may be as simple, uh, this idea came to mind, it may be as simple as rolling your neighbor's trash can up to their house. You know, the people who leave their trash can out by the, the road for a week. And you're mad. 
Maybe you have a homeowners association thing and they just, they're just they messing that all up and it just makes your house look trashy and, you, and it just makes you so mad. And you have a right and you're entitled because you paid for it and you earned it. But, but, and, and all that's probably true. Can you just assume responsibility that maybe something's going on in their life? Can you just assume responsibility that maybe they're forgetful? But can you take off whatever entitlement you have and maybe just walk the trash can up to their house and take responsibility? There's a million ways you can do that, but could you leave here today doing for others as you've witnessed him do for you? Heavenly Father, man, this is so challenging, but Lord, would you help us? Because we do have a heart to at times. Lord, there's, you've been working in our hearts. And, and even those who may still be far from you, Lord, this still rings with such an appeal, with such an attraction. But, but God, we are human. Would you teach us and show us and equip us and empower us to be human in a different way? Help us, Heavenly Father, to, to follow your way. And Lord God, I pray that we can take an inventory of our life and all those things that we feel that we have a right to and that we're entitled to. And Lord God, we would exchange those for responsibilities and realize how empowered we are. Lord, somebody's got to do it. Somebody will. Would you let it be me? Would you let it, would you let it be us? Let us. Do what we're expecting others to do. Let us become the people we keep looking for everybody else to be. Let us be the reflection of your son in our world. It's in his name we pray. Amen.